So again, thanks for coming, and uh, I'll turn it over to Jason. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is kind of my favorite way to give a talk with no notes available and beer. <laughs> this is, this is going to be good. Um, thankfully, I've had a couple of run-throughs recently, so I think we'll be in good shape. Um, how many people have heard about variable funds before? Awesome. How many people have actually played with them so far? Good. That's awesome. Um, hopefully, after this, you'll all like run over a code pen and grab lots of sample stuff and play around with it, because they're really quite cool. But what I want to sort of set the stage for a little bit, and I'm going to do my best to remember what I have in the speaker notes. See how that goes. But um, when I gave this talk the first time, that in the better part a couple weeks ago, Jen Simmons had given a talk a couple days earlier. And some of you might have heard about that, where she coined the phrase intrinsic web design. And what she meant by that is something that I think is really significant because. Responsive web design is really all about simply making things respond or work well based on the viewport. And, and we could get into the semantics of that and what that really means. But what the difference is when Jen's talking about intrinsic web design is things that are of the web, but not really just ported to it. Thinking about design when you have access to things like CSS grid, um, things like much more advanced typographic techniques, think about how we apply these ideas of graphic design that have been around for over a century or more and use them in a way that still feels native to the web. And that really resonated with me because type and words are one of the main things that you see on the web besides cat videos. So I do try and have an antidote to that, and that usually comes in the form, well, this is just some of the places where I've been giving this talk, and there were some very pithy notes that went along with this about kind of thinking about this from a web design and a type perspective. Um, so that was my last couple of weeks uh, in Seattle and then and Berlin at a type conference. And the perspectives there were really interesting. People who were very much about the web, this crowd, that was an event part. And, and then in Berlin, people all about type design and type technology. And, and the different perspectives and what was important to each audience was really kind of striking. And this is the part, there we go. Now we're going to get away from cat videos. Um, so uh, this talk is about how type and the web are so tied and what we want to be able to do to enhance the meaning of that content and how variable fonts are going to play a part in that. And I do use Tristan and Tilly as um, points, uh, helping me illustrate some points every now and then. So this is just your first introduction. You will see them come back. I will make sure everybody's paying attention. But to go back a little bit, and this goes back actually five or six hundred years, thinking about how we communicate in writing and how we communicate importance and meaning is very much manifest in, in the physical representation that we see here. This is a, a book of Psalms from probably about the 15th century. So there was a printing press. It was used. Um, it was fairly rudimentary. But, but with all of the illustrations and, uh, and care that went into this, it was very clear that that was amplifying the meaning of the words that were being put across. It was meant to be seen as precious. And truly, you had to be quite wealthy in order to have something like this, so it really quite literally was precious. Some other ways going forward as we've been working through, or I'm, we're broadcasting this live, and I'm actually, this is through a Hangout. So I see it here, and then it comes up there about four seconds later. I'm working on that timing. But, um, so this was a, a, a sign uh, from a pub in Brighton. And it really did give a feeling for that time and place. And I really think that that amplifies, again, the, the feeling and the meaning of going, going into that place. Um, this is a drawing from a monotype matrix. And this was a, a way of creating and casting hot metal type. And 
the drawing had to encompass all of the different permutations. So we've been working at perfecting the way we find structure and meaning and translate that into something that creates impact with us visually. We've been working on this for a really long time. And finding that structure and meaning isn't just in typography, it's also elsewhere. Leonardo da Vinci was spending an inordinate amount of time trying to decipher proportions in the human body and translate that into what defines beauty and what defines elegance. Um, in both man and nature and in, in communication. And so going forward, we've been working at this for a really long time. Uh, this book was published in, I think, first in the 90s. And this was all about trying to define typographic style. What are the rules? What are the, how do we break down and, and communicate to people in a meaningful way with this one perfect system of proportion? Now, I'm going to backtrack a little bit to the early part of the 20th century and talk about this essay, The Crystal Goblet, written by Beatrice Ward, where she put forth the notion that there is this one perfect typography that conveys the content without coloring its meaning. And that's what she was talking about, this notion of a crystal goblet. And there's a lot of people that would debate whether or not that's a valid concept that you can have typography that doesn't influence meaning. I would be one of the people that would say you can't really do that. I think it's undone by the very decisions and the, and the typeface choices you make are going to either amplify or dilute that message. Uh, but that was one way of looking at the world of communication that was very, very popular and was very influential in, in the 1930s and later. But type is never neutral. Even if you decide to set something in Helvetica, it might say something, but not really mean it. The whole point of Helvetica is to not impart meaning. But by choosing to use that typeface, you're telling the reader that you don't really want to emphasize what you're getting across. But if you're a type-obsessed hipster, you might say something like this. And it might carry a little bit different feeling. But this might not do all of it because that's actually written by a human hand. So there's a definite difference in the way you read that based on how it's presented. So the power of type and typography to influence meaning is hard to deny. And that's a really important concept. So I think that that really undercuts what Beatrice Ward was trying to get at in the Crystal Goblet. There are a lot of ways to typeset something. It's very difficult to avoid this. Type is how we hear what we read. It gives voice to our words. And, and ironically enough, that was one of another really famous quote from Beatrice Ward. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but type is the clothes our words wear. And we know that clothes influence the way people perceive us and how we present to the world. So the idea that type could be neutral, I felt is a bit at odds, uh, just with, with her own writing. And if we look at this book here, we've been, there we go, um, we've been perfecting this in printed communication. This is a, a book that came out recently. Um, it's actually all about W.A. Dwiggins' work, who is actually a native of Hingham, Massachusetts, a very influential and, and prolific type designer and graphic designer. Uh, this book was, was put out last year, and it uses his work to great effect. It's a really beautifully typeset book. Uh, we're able to do an awful lot of those similar things on the web. This is a screen capture of a web page, and the typefaces are, are bespoke. Uh, we've got ligatures, we've got initial capitals, we've got a lot of really nice typographic touches in there. It does come at a cost, though. So we are able to do a lot of these things on the web, but we don't do a lot of them because of the basic reason of performance. So we want to be expressive, but we have to pull back because we need the content to show up in the first place. So there's a lot of tension. That's that. <laughs> so we've got three things kind of tugging at our design system. We have people who want to change the content itself or change the, the appearance of it. So we've, we've got design questions 
We've got content questions because we've got publishers who constantly want to go in and change the text that's there on the page. And then we've got engineering who says, scrap all of that, we need another JavaScript library, so no one wants me. <laughs> it happens. It happens. I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> but that's the reality of all of our lives working on the web. So I say lives or wives. I meant lives. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but that's the truth, is that, that we always have to balance these things. So design encompasses performance, and I would say that performance is actually the most influential and first, uh, first experience aspect of design. We really can't ignore that, but we do have this reality where our typographic voice is constrained considerably. And I really like this quote from, from Rich Rudder who wrote a fantastic book called Web Typography and also is the organizer of the Ampersand Conference over in Brighton and one of the founders of Clear Left. If you don't know Rich Rudder, you probably have heard of Jeremy Keith, who is one of his partners in that business and probably one of the more influential people in my life in learning about web design. Um, but this is the kind of thing that happens. We want to have typographic voice, but in order to get it on screen quickly, we, we pair back and we lose a little bit of that voice. And currently, what we've tried to do, and uh, I might be picking on you a little bit now, but uh, this is really about our current best answer in trying to come up with how do we house all of our different uh, the aspects of our design system to work across all different devices, to work across all different forms of content. This one perfect answer for our website to present all content is a style guide. And there's really only a couple that I was able to find that actually were reacting to screen size in addition to content and, and everything else. Um, Shopify does a pretty good job, but really they're just looking at small and large screen. If you really want to see something thorough, take a look at the gel site from BBC. Their global experience language is incredibly well thought out. And you'll notice if you look at this chart here, they're looking at a huge number of different screen sizes and, and combinations of type hierarchies to figure out what's going to work really well across all of these different devices that are viewing, viewing your site. So this is our current best effort and, and what we hold up as kind of the, the perfect way for us to be designing through the web. And that brings another danger, because we're talking about something that will work for everything. And therein lies a little bit of a trap. Uh, if we think about the notion of average, if any of you are a fan of 99% Invisible, it's a, it's a great podcast. And this particular episode was about planes. That's a bit of an oblique connection, but bear with me for a second. During the 1920s, they set about designing the cockpit and controls for the fighter aircraft in the Army. This was before the Air Force was even a thing. And what they did was they measured all of their pilots. And they took all these average measurements for all of their pilots, and that's how they positioned the seat height, the harnesses, the controls. All the positioning was based on this set of averages. And what happened was 20 years later, after World War II, they created the Air Force. They had to bring in a lot more pilots. They had a whole lot of people, and their fatalities were going through the roof. And they had no idea why. It's in training. It wasn't even in combat. And so they set about doing a little bit of analysis. And any good researchers are going to start with first principles and look at how they got here. They looked at those measurements. They then set out measuring a whole bunch of their pilots. And it turns out that not a single one of the pilots fit all 10 of the measurements around which they built the cockpits of these aircraft. If they reduced it to only three of those measurements, they still only got 5%. So what happened was by designing for average, it was optimized for no one, literally no one. As soon as they made everything adjustable, performance went through the roof, fatalities went down. That was an obvious solution for them once they had the data to back it up. So what's going on is that by designing for average, you're actually not really optimizing for anyone. And that's really the same situation in which we find ourselves on the web. 
by trying to create one design system that suits all content, we're actually optimizing it for nothing. So we've created this system that doesn't really have any, any real soul to it when it comes to the specific of the content. So any blog post might look okay, or any product page might look okay, but what about this story? What about today's headline? What about that impact that you get from how a newspaper will change the layout of the homepage because there's a really big story. They can react to that in a way that we currently really can't on the web. We've created a new crystal goblin. We've tried to create in design systems this one perfect answer for all content. Now, it's not that they're a bad thing, but they're a foundation. They're not the final point of destination. We have to remember that. A great design system is a great foundation upon which we can build really good graphic design. We found ourselves in the winter of our discontent. Then came something new. And it's only been about a year and a half since this happened. Um, this was introduced in September of 2016 at a type conference in Warsaw, Poland. It was a bunch of uh, people from Microsoft, Apple, Google, and Adobe. Uh, a number of other people were involved, but those were the four main companies that were behind this evolution of the open text specification. And from many comes one. Uh, so we have a whole bunch of font files which are now encompassed in a single font file. And if you've ever had to deal with web fonts, you know you've got to load, let's leave font formats aside. But for every single weight and width and variant, you've got to load a separate file in order to get the thin, the wide, the heavy, the light, the italics, all of those things, every single one is a separate file. That can all be contained in one file now. And the way that that works is all of that data is stored as simply offsets from the normal size and shape of the character. So it's a very efficient format. All it has to do is store the corner points and the curve points, and what's the difference for the regular character to the thin one, to the fat one, and so forth. So we're able to have a whole lot of information <laughs> contained in that one file, and don't forget that you also can get slammed. <laughs> so this is structured around uh, what are currently five registered axes, so axes of variation is what we're referring to. And those are weight. And you can see how this works. You can see that how the CSS is structured down below. And all of this is accessible just through either a mapping to an existing attribute or using font variation settings. So I'll show you more examples of that as we go. Uh, we have width is another one. Let's see how that works. Slant. Now, slant is different from italics, and I'll actually show you the difference here. Slant is usually something that you would see called an oblique in, uh, in typeface terms. Um, this is actually something that you can animate. It's probably only applicable to a sans serif typeface in most cases, but uh, that's not always the case. It's really up to a type designer. And then an italic usually brings with it the notion of uh, glyph changes. So notice the lowercase a in particular. And this is really just on or off. There's no animation between those states. So there's something important to point out here. The way the format works is tailored to exactly how the type designer wants it. This is not an artificial distortion of typeface, but you can only make it as thin or as wide as the type designer allows. And the same is true for glyph substitution in something like italic or, um, or not. Uh, and they're able to say there's no sliding scale that's either on or off. So there's a lot of control that's given to the type designer. It is not up to the browser to decide to do whatever it wants to the typeface. This isn't a synthesis. These are actually just specifically exposed axes of control. And the last one that is one of the registered uh, axes for now is optical size. Optical size is really interesting. And I, I think that. Um, David did a great job 
uh, showcasing this when he spoke last fall. I've got to give you a little bit of a refresher on that in case you didn't see that. But watch what happens to the thick and thin of the strokes of those characters and see, see what happens when it goes back down. The whole idea of optical sizing is at a physically smaller size, you want to have a little bit less contrast in the thick and thin of those strokes so that you don't lose the thin lines. And so it maintains a little bit greater degree of readability at physically smaller sizes. But that's not it. And the cool thing about this format is that the type designer can build any axes of variation in here that they'd like. And it's really only limited to their own imagination. I'll, I'll talk about a couple of different ones, but uh, some of the more common ones might be text grade. And the interesting thing about text grade is that it thickens the, the strokes overall without changing the total space that it occupies. So there's a couple of ways immediately that come to mind, like UI animations, where you would like to create a slightly bolder effect on something with an animation without actually changing the size of the element itself. Uh, so animating text on buttons or in navigation would be one example. But the other example that I'll show you later on might be the overall grade of the text in something like a low light scenario. Um, or if somebody has low vision. So exposing controls to the user to create a more readable screen full of text is something that is entirely within our control now. So greater accessibility, greater readability in a broader set of user contexts. So there are others that uh, I can show examples here. Um, that stands for Y transparent ascender and descender. And I won't even pretend to get into the mind of the person that designed this because he's just way smarter than I am. But if you want to copy fit a headline and you really want to set the type close together, you might want to just make those ascenders and descenders a little bit shorter so you don't get collisions in the letters as they wrap from one line to the next. So there's really interesting things you can do with that to actually tailor the shapes of the letters based on given context and, and ways that you might use them. And then we've got really crazy examples like this typeface Decavar. You can do a lot of really weird stuff with it. I'm going to show you another animation of something that Mandy Michael did uh, later on, which is really pretty remarkable. Uh, she's done some really fantastic experiments. Uh, but that was really intended as uh, just an example of all of, uh, all kinds of different things that you might, might do. But in this illustration, if you take a look at this carefully and all, follow all of these points, you'll see that this shows virtually every width and weight of that character. And it shows how all those points interconnect. But again, this is only what the type designer intended. So the standard shape is what you see in the foreground. And then all the other all their points are the offsets. And that's what the typeface format is, is storing. And the example here is that um, you might see one of these typefaces be 150 or 200K as a true type file. And then you compress it as a WAF2. It might be down to 80 or 90K, replacing 700K worth of font data or more, and effectively giving you a million different choices in between. So from a practical standpoint, there's going to be a significant performance gain in file size, fewer HTTP requests, so there's less latency in what the browser's doing and how it's processing that stuff and checking caches and redrawing the page. And you have everything accessible <laughs> through CSS. There's going to be a, a substantial gain overall, plus you get the added voice as a designer. I know you're that kind of crowd, so we'll get to some code. Um, what I want to show you is that it's not really that different in many cases. You're still using a, a very similar syntax. Now, ideally, it should be true type variations. That's not implemented across enough browsers yet. So um, you can just stick with format of true type, or if you've got a WAF2 file, you can use that just as easily. The spec details a way that this will be mapped back to existing attributes for font weight, font stretch, font style, and 
But I don't think I have in here is it, in font style you can also specify oblique and a number of degrees. So that's the way you can tie into slant. So it's still using standard CSS attributes in order to, to reach that. And then font optical sizing, you set that either on, off, or auto. By default, in most browsers, the way they're going, the implementation will be that it will be automatic. So that it will course the optical sizing, if it's available in that typeface, will be set to correspond with the rendered size of the type. So that's how that numbering scale works. An optical size value of 12 would match up with a 12 pixel rendering of that type. Now, if you need to specify things in all the browsers that support it right now, you have to use font variation settings. That's more of the low level way of specifying things. And for anything that is a non-standard axis that you want to modify specifically, that's how you would have to do it is, is modifying here. The one thing that you have to keep in mind is that if you change want to change one of those values, you have to redeclare all of them. But I do have an interesting little workaround for that using CSS variables. So we can talk about that. Uh, this is how it would look if you were specifying a bunch of standard and non-registered axes. The syntax difference here is important. Some browsers will ignore it if you don't get it quite right. Custom axes need to be in uppercase. Registered axes need to be in lowercase. Now, as far as support goes, it's actually quite good already. Um, it's shipping at the OS level in iOS. Mac OS High Sierra and Windows 10. It's currently fully supported in Mac and Windows Chrome. On iOS, it works in every browser. Um, it works in Safari and High Sierra. It might have shipped in Edge already, or it's just about to. And in Firefox, in the nightly build that is on by default, they just missed the shipping date for June. It looks like it's probably now going to ship in August. But I'm going to show that stuff to you because one of the reasons Firefox is delaying is because they want their dev tools to ship with it too, and they've got some really kick-ass dev tools for working with variable fonts. So we'll take a look at those as well. And I do want to mention this here in case some of you are not aware, all of the CSS working group discussion is happening on GitHub. So when you're working and are experimenting with any of these things, if you see things that aren't behaving the way you would expect, there's a place that you can go to ask the people who are working on the spec, and the browser vendors are there, uh, people like myself and David Jonathan Ross and other people that, and actually uh, Lawrence Penny, who creates the Access Praxis website that some of you may have seen. Um, all the people that are working on this are there and discussing it and answering questions, and this is a really great opportunity for you to be part of shaping the web. And we need more people who are developers and designers actually participating in that conversation. So. Um, I have uh, PDF versions of these slides posted on my site. I'll make sure that we uh, get the link up on the screen at some point so that you can go and get that stuff and, and follow up on some of these resources as well. Um, this is the Access Praxis website that I was mentioning. So there are a few places to go to try these things out. So access-praxis.org is a little variable font playground that Lawrence put together, and you can select any of these blocks of copy, change the text, change the font, and it exposes all of the different sliders here that you can play around with and experiment with how the, the typeface can work. He also has built-in detection for open type features as well. So if the typeface supports ligatures or kerning or alternate number sets, all of those things are available to play with there as well. Um, Nick Sherman also recently launched vfonts.com, that's v-fonts.com, which is also attempting to catalog all of the available variable fonts, and he's updating that all the time. Um, I think between the two events that I spoke at like two weeks ago and three weeks ago, 15 more have been added. So like, there's a whole bunch. Um, a lot of different type designers are really now getting into working on them in earnest, so there are some good commercial ones available in addition to lots of open source ones on GitHub. Um, and finally, um, Monotype also just open sourced this tool, which you can download and run on your own system, 
where you can drag and drop a variable font into the top bar and it will show you all of the sliders and available values and then this functions as a type tester down below. It's an editable content area that you can just type in and then see how that variable font will render. Um, Microsoft also recently launched this. I know it's a horribly long URL. I did have a chance to make a bit of a link for that. Um, but it's a wonderful explanation of variable fonts as well as a bunch of demonstrations um, and a lot of links to additional resources. So uh, that's a good one to take a look at. Um, Type Network is also working on a site that they have up now. It's, it's fairly limited at the moment, but I'm um, actually working with them on that. And there's going to be a glossary and a whole bunch of other resources there as well. And that's variablefonts.typenetwork.com. And here's a little preview of what's coming in the developer tools. Now, this was this is actually a sketch file. I sent a picture of this actually during the event, but um, Developer tools now have a font panel, and with the addition of in the nightly build the variable font tools, you can click on this little icon, and currently you'll get this piece right here. Story. Um, you'll get the, all the sliders that you can play with right in the browser and see the rendered CSS, so you can then copy it right back out. So it's kind of like having access practices built into your web browser. So that in working with them in the context of your layout, you can play around with these things and um, and then get those rendered values and bring it back into your into your CSS. Uh, so it's pretty exciting. That went from a sketch one week to a week later. I got this message from Jen, and literally the night before that talk in Berlin, that first build landed. It went from a sketch to working code in a week. Um, so they're really putting a lot of energy into, into developing these tools. The Firefox team is really knocking it out of the park. Um, this is something else that I think is coming soon from Google and, and Type Network. It's actually a variable version of Roboto. Uh, so uh, this is the non-variable version. When it gets into the variable version, it adds text grade and a few other things to improve the rendering in different usage contexts. Uh, I'm not sure which. I think it's width, weight, and optical size will be available, um, which is going to make it an incredibly versatile typeface out of this. Uh, I'm not sure the timing for that release, but it's coming. Um, so that's a little bit about the state of variable fonts, but now I want to talk to you a little bit more about how we should be using them, how we should be thinking about the impact they can have on typography. So, even if we think about just improving our status quo, if we were to look, this is where I really need the notes, um, on ESPN, they could save two or 300K easily by swapping out the few variable, uh, the few weights of Benton Sands that they're using with the variable font version. If we were to look at the Wall Street Journal, <coughs> they're loading over 600K of font data they can cut it down to probably 200K, maybe even less, by replacing what they're, what they're using with two or three variable fonts that would cover everything that they're currently doing in the, in the kind of face design that they have right now. And Quartz.com has probably some of the best typography I've seen in terms of creating a really strong visual hierarchy. They're loading four weights. Uh, four weights of two different typefaces in both standard and extended Latin and Cyrillic. So it's well over 700K of font data that they could replace with probably two to 300 in a variable font, or two. Um, so there's incredible savings that they could get in what they're currently doing, but then also have the added benefit of not being so constrained to only having one weight for a header and one weight for body copy. They'd really be able to extend the dynamic range of how they're putting stuff on screen. So they get to have their cake and eat it quickly. I think that's really important. I got a lot of grief for having just a screen grab of an emoji for that. So I just want you to know that that was a hand-drawn slice of cake. <laughs> so it's really it's, it's a future worth looking, look, looking ahead for. But typography for reading. I want to talk about how we can better use variable fonts to improve that experience. 
but it does take thinking about something in a new way. <coughs> Rethinking how I approach typography and how I think about that hierarchy across different screen sizes really meant that I had to think about seeing something for the first time. I wrote about this a number of years ago uh, about creating this hierarchy of sizes for headings and body copy for this screen size and this screen size and this screen size. And, and it made sense to me as a graphic designer giving me the chance to design and think about explicit relationships and hierarchies based on this range of screen sizes. But that's still a fairly limited way of thinking. Um, it's really just being adaptive. In this size range, I want this set of proportions. In this size range, I want this set of proportions. But as screen resolutions improve and the number of devices proliferate, that gets more and more brittle. But I ended up seeing something from Jen Simmons, and this was back at the Artifact Conference, probably in 2014, maybe, um, where she was the first person to show me sizing using viewport units. So that's, that's the animation that this was showing here. There we go. So sizing type using viewport width units does a beautiful job of scaling that type. But the problem is you don't have a minimum and a maximum. So if you're using viewport units and you make the screen really small and it keeps getting smaller, it's going to get really, really tiny. Likewise, if you're scaling it up to a 27-inch monitor or bigger, it's going to look really crazy. Tim Brown from TypeKit came up with this idea called CSS Locks, where it's taking that viewport idea, but it's actually tying it to a low end and a high end. And so the way he presented this idea was you would set what is the, the smallest size. Now, this is an example for line height. So he's saying 1.3 and 1.5, and you're defining it with a min width and a max width breakpoint. Or think of it as if you start with your mobile first, you're going to say it's 1.3. But once it hits the minimum width of, let's say, 25M, it's going to start to scale. But when it hits, let's say, 75, so we're thinking a pretty large desktop, it won't get any bigger than that. And there's a crazy bunch of math in the middle. And I'll give you a headache with that in a minute. But it's a really interesting way of thinking about this. So what's the smallest I want this set of proportions to be, and what's the biggest? Let everything else in the middle take care of itself. And it took me a while to kind of let go of some of my own hang-ups on exerting that control, which is kind of ironic because I've been telling designers they have to relinquish that control for about 20 years. I'm still a victim of my own bias. But I, I really started to, to gravitate to this, and I've done a lot of experiments with it, and I really think that this is an interesting way of going about things. So we start by using custom properties or CSS variables. We define the breakpoints that we're looking for. We define the low and the high end size. And then we get into a bunch of math. So here's what we're doing. We're starting mobile first. So this is the low end. We take that. It's just a calculation to add an M value to that low end range. And the reason I do that is because we need a unitless value in the math that we're going to see in a minute. Once we re reach that minimum width of 75M, here's the high end. So we start, and we had 5 and 10. So it's 5M, or 5 times 16 pixels, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then 10 times that, once it gets down here, and in the middle, headache. But the cool thing about this is you never have to do anything to this formula. Because all you have to do is supply the low and the high end values in the breakpoints. I mean, this formula works for anything you want to throw at it. This is kind of like Ethan Marcotte's like, target divided by context equals results. It's like that original formula for figuring things out in, in uh, responsive design. So what this calculation is doing, this is for font size. It's calculating the minimum size value, and then it's doing a bunch of work with the breakpoints and the maximum size and viewport units. And it's coming out with a number value that is going to smoothly scale from 5 to 10 based on the width of the window between those two breakpoints. And when you couple that with not just font size, but line height, line length, and other variable font characteristics like the width of the characters themselves, optical sizing, all those things become a really powerful system that can tailor the type and the typography 
across screen size. And it's not going to matter how often those devices change because it's all in relative units, so it's all going to be rendered at the best possible resolution that the device can support. So this is an example of that worked into a web page, and this is up on CodePen. I'll give you a link to go find that stuff. Um, and the way this is all scaling, what we've altered here is in the heading up top, we've changed the font size, the font stretch or the width of the characters themselves, the optical sizing, the line height, and the height of the ascenders and descenders. We'll look at that a little bit more closely in a minute so you can see it in greater detail. And then in the body copy, we've done, uh, we've, we've played around with the font size, the optical sizing, the stretch, and the line height. And what we've ended up doing is slightly narrowing the width of the characters on that small screen. So we're not making the type size smaller. We're just making the characters slightly narrower, and we can easily go from 35 to 40 characters per line to a little over 50 characters per line. And what that ends up doing is giving us a more readable line length. Because as the way we take in information is not in one word or one letter at a time, it's in groups of words or groups of syllables. And if it's too short, it's hard for us to have a comfortable rhythm. That's why choppy newspapers aren't really comfortable for long form reading. Books try and reach that 60 to 75 or 80 characters per line. That's a little bit more comfortable. It's a little bit more of what we're used to when we're trying to get into the rhythm of reading content. So anything that we can do to get a little bit closer without sacrificing legibility is going to aid in readability. So I want to divert a little bit and look and show you a little bit more about optical sizing because I think this is something that is going to be one of the more significant things about variable fonts. It's not going to be available in everything, and it's not always necessary for sans serif typefaces, but for serif ones, it's pretty remarkable. So naturally, I decided to go back 300 years, 400, uh, 1720, so almost exactly 400 years ago. Uh, this is a type specimen from William Caslon, and if we kind of blow this up and look at a normalized equivalent of a six-point version down below and a 72-point version, you can see how different those character shapes are. You can take a look here and see that the thick and thin contrast here is much more exaggerated in the 72-point version, and especially when you're printing in cheap paper, it's really important that you make those characters pretty sturdy. And if you take a look over here on the side, I forced the optical sizing off, and then you can look at it side by side with the optical sizing on, and it's almost like a completely different typeface. In the larger size, you can see a much more delicate stroke contrast that really accentuates the design of the typeface and lets you see the real beauty in that design, whereas at the physically smaller size, it still holds up, even at, at that smaller uh, smaller size, it's much more readable. So if we, if we were to force it all like this down below, that thick and thin, once it's represented in that physically smaller size, would get much harder to read. So going back into our, our basic reading experience, the optical sizing is just one of the things that we can play around with to make sure that the type stays really crisp and readable at these different sizes. Um, this is just going to show you another example of looking at the character width. So these are screenshots from uh, <coughs> iPhone 10. So fairly common screen size these days, not as big as a plus, but by slightly narrowing those character shapes, we're able to dramatically increase the number of words per line, and it doesn't have that big a difference in the shape of those characters. So it's not going to create something that's a lot harder on the eyes, but it is going to give you a much better line map. So that's just showing the difference in English and German. Uh, the German words tend to, uh, Oftentimes, people use hyphenation less, but it's also a much longer word length. Um, so having a slightly narrower character will mean fewer odd breaks with those words. Now, text grade is another one of the things that I talked about. And this really can come into play uh, it'd be really useful when we're looking at a reverse contrast. So dark background with light text, like a nighttime reading mode. Uh, if we enable text grade, 
we could make that a, a much uh, a much more readable character by uh, thickening up the strokes just a little bit when you reverse the contrast that way. Uh, and then in terms of like an accessibility setting, if we were to look at doing that just in a standard view, you can see that that actually makes it a, a much stronger contrast between the text and the background. So. So in terms of that overall reading experience, we're able to tailor the character size, we're able to uh, tailor the optical sizing, the width, the weight, excuse me, all of these things to react not only to the screen size, but also the user context. Um, one of the other things that I, I didn't mention, on um, the text grade, if it's a native app, you could tie into the ambient light sensor. So if it's actually a lower ambient light, you could increase that contrast as well and not require an additional brightness setting in the screen to still make it pretty readable. So there's a lot of interesting things that you can do. And this is an example of using text grade in a UI element. Kind of hard to see the animation when it's going that slowly, but um, turn that again. There we go. Um, so you can get those animation effects and couple them with things like uh, you know, gradient change or, or whatever else you want to play around with, and you won't resize any of your elements, but you can still create a stronger differentiation between the on and the off state. And this is another one of those experiments that I was uh, telling you about. Uh, Mandy Michael used Decovar to create this effect, and used in terms of something really whimsical, um, but if you really want to, you know, if you're looking for ways that you can add a little bit more whimsy, a little bit more fun to the design, uh, being able to play around with some of that stuff is, is pretty interesting. But I do want to talk about um, uh, what I think is next in web design and, and typography, and that's really about editorial design and art direction. Because now that we have the ability to have these, this single asset or just a couple of assets that are included in a theme, and it's all changeable with CSS, that opens up some interesting opportunities for us to start to build more into the browser, build more, in, excuse me, build more into the content management system itself. So here's another example. We take a look at what we want to do to set that headline much more closely together what you end up with are little collisions between the ascenders and descenders, and you really don't want that in your design. It's just kind of an ugly little bit of typography, which we can easily fix if we can shorten the ascenders and descenders. So we can get the typographic effect we're looking for and tailor the letter shapes just a little bit so that we can have that greater impact without sacrificing the quality of the typography overall. And another example is doing something like styling a pull quote if we're able to build in uh, some access to some of this, the weight and width uh, parameters in styling that, that text, we can then wrap it all in a viewport unit so that it will scale just as easily as you go onto a narrower screen and still maintain the typographic feeling that you're looking for. I put this up here because I want us to sort of take a look at that front page and look at all of the different levels of typographic hierarchy that they use in print. So they've got the big masthead here, the tall, thin, all caps that's really characteristic of the Wall Street Journal. They're still using that tall, thin, mixed case here for this heading, a different style here, different style here, different style down here, all different levels of headings that are giving you an indication of what is the most important story and what comes next. And when we end up looking at what they're doing online, they basically have two and that's it. So they've really lost a lot of that range of voice that they have in giving people an indication of what is more important than something else. And that's part of that whole system of that was that was optimistic that I was going to actually get that word out right. In systematizing that design, <laughs> we end up normalizing. And, and we lose out on some of that flexibility in terms of 
creating that greater level of accentuation that we saw in the print version. So that gets even worse the further out from the source that we go. And this is something that I think is a very real issue, and not just here in the United States, but, but elsewhere. We're designing our content and our systems to be portable. It's, the, it's like the new black to make your CMS headless and then push your content out everywhere. And you're syndicating it to LinkedIn, you're syndicating it to Facebook, um, into Apple News, and it's not taking its voice. It's just sending the text. So the only indicator that you have of authority and authenticity is a tiny little logo here that, in the best case, that's the only thing that's going to give any further indicator that your content is any more believable than anybody else's. So I'm not trying not to you know, throw the, the fake news hashtag around, but this is a very real thing. By taking away the type, you take away the signifier that is burned into your brain, helping you recognize that that's from The Guardian, or that's from The New York Times, or that's from the New York, the Washington Post, because we have these visual associations that are shaped by the type in which that content is set. So that's a really important thing for us to think about. Instead of having a crystal goblet, really, we've got like the red solo goblet. <laughs> and, and so it, by taking away all of the differentiators and signifiers of authority, we're taking the context away and we're removing all of the value that the type adds in not only accentuating the meaning, but conveying the authority of the source. So that's, that's something that, that we could fix, perhaps, because there is no, oh, that's right, we had to more on brand. It's really a blue solo cup, which is Facebook. We have to remember that there's no crystal goblet for information either. So when you take away, there's no one perfect form. That's Facebook news. And you can't even find it. You can't distinguish a news item from something else in your feed. So there's no perfect way, neutral way, to present news because you still need to convey the authority of the source. And what I found really interesting is this is a site that I don't think a lot of people have been looking at. It's called Blendle. It started over in Europe, but they launched in the US maybe a year, year and a half ago. And what they do is bring in stories from a number of different publishers, but when you pick that story, and it's sort of a micropayment, you might pay 20 cents for an article, you know you're reading the New York Times. It feels like the New York Times. It looks like the New York Times. Because when they present it, they use their type. And if it comes from the New Yorker, you sure as heck know that's the New Yorker. Because they've used their type. And so they're, they're tying into those visual signifiers when they're presenting this content, and it presents it in a much more authentic way. And so I think this is an important thing for us to keep in mind. What, diff, what kind of difference there is in how we present news content and, and how we might do it better. So this is not the end solution, but you can think of this as the content going with its voice. And so variable fonts and subsetting and better compression, all of those things go together with syndicating that content. It does open up the door for us to be a little bit better about how we send this content around. So there's definitely some interesting things to think about there. But I want to come back to just our own world, working in our own website, and thinking about how we might better that process. So this is a, a demo that I put together last year in Drupal, where you can go and edit that one <coughs> chunk of text and say, for that line of text, I'd like to crank out the weight a little bit, and then just hit the save, and there you go. So it's actually quite possible for us to start building these tools into the content management system, write out a tiny little bit of CSS that goes with it. You could get even smarter if you're a better developer than I am, build it into a module. But it's a really simple way to put editorial typographic control in the hands of the person managing the content. So that might not be every editor that you want to give that to, but you can create a role for a designer to go in and edit that content and typeset it. And maybe they typeset the headline. Maybe they typeset just the, the pull quotes. But we could do a lot of interesting things that way. Uh, there are other kinds of UIs that we might think about. So this video, you should go watch 
for a lot of reasons, uh, but it's all about uh, exploring Arabic typography. And, and there's a, a I'm going to get it, I'm not going to say it right, but uh, Kishida are these, uh, it's a stroke that is usually a connector between phrasing or, or words, and that is often extended in calligraphy to indicate how you might read it. That's perfectly acceptable to do in a variable font. So if that's one of the axes of variation is the length of that particular kind of character, they actually made a UI where all those highlighted red areas, you could actually click and drag. And that would actually act on the rendering of the type and modify the CSS. So we can think about a different kind of web UI that's not a slider, but that actually lets you just click and drag on the width and X height of different characters in that in, in the content management system. So I mean, I think there's some really interesting things that we could start to think about now that we know what capabilities exist. It doesn't have to just be a slider. We could actually interact with and act upon the type directly and then just store the output from that. So uh, that demo is probably two thirds or three quarters of the way through the talk, but really the whole thing is pretty fascinating. You'll learn a ton. You should definitely check that out. Uh, these are all, if you, if you just search for Typo Labs Berlin, you'll see a whole, on YouTube, you'll see a whole slew of videos, all the talks recorded, and they're, uh, they're up there for you to view. That's a really, really good one. Uh, now, I wanted to sort of see if I could put this to the test um, and try and create a version of the Wall Street Journal that feels a little bit more like the print version of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so I didn't have access to their actual typeface, but this is a page I put together um, using CSS Grid and variable fonts, and I wanted to see exactly how we might work with this. And so we used Grid to define some areas where I could really help accentuate things typographically a little bit more. And I think that you'll see as the, as the screen size changes, things scale and move pretty nicely, especially for a pretty quickly put together demo, but it has a little bit more of a feeling of that print version of the Wall Street Journal than their current online version does. And that really wouldn't require a whole lot of effort for them to retrofit this and just take advantage of some of those more modern CSS techniques to tie into the minimum and maximum scaling, and using the viewport width to scale some of the larger headlines, use the variable fonts tied into that as well to modify the width and the weight as the screen size changes, and you could really create a, a much more compelling experience for people that would be a lot more tied to the way they present things in print. Uh, and I wanted to look at some other ways that we experiment with art direction. Um, one of the things that you see in print publications a lot is that blending of image and type. So I created this other sample page. This one's also up on, on CodePen as well. And we've got a nice big photo. Um, it's really beautiful, but we might want to have a message that goes with it. So we might think of just layering text over it. And that's OK. Um, that's kind of expected. We do that sort of thing a lot. But it'd be pretty neat if it was kind of interacting with the photo. So if we had another photo, that was positioned just with z-index, but in the, in the same place, and we masked out a little bit. Now we start to get into something that looks a little bit more art-directed, a little bit more like what you'd see in a magazine publication or, or a cover. And that's all done with simply two images and some live text. That would not be something very difficult for us to build into a CMS and give a little bit more control to the editors to actually create something that looks really interesting and also scales really well. So a little bit more of the rest of the page. So you can see it does have a pretty strong typographic hierarchy across uh, the different range of stories. And it also scales really nicely too. So even with those photographic effects, uh, it takes a little bit of planning, sure, but it only took me about 20 minutes to do the Photoshop work. And you could do a better job, but I mean, it really does uh, open up a lot of possibilities, and it just takes being a little bit more creative with the way we're thinking about working with the web. So this isn't just type. It's also about thinking about CSS Grid, how we might layer these things together, 
thinking about art direction and, and what makes a compelling visual experience while still being set in the context of something that is maintainable. Because we have to be able to maintain this. We have to put these controls in the hands of the content editors. We don't want to be rewriting the CSS every day. You never have to do that in this circumstance. It would be entirely within their control without writing a line of code. Because really, at its heart, type on the screen is intrinsically of the web. It always has been. But the problem is, we don't have one form of typography that will work without inform, like without changing any meaning. And one design system is not always going to be right for any content. And there's no way that one form of content can present any voice, like Facebook News. Because good typography is intentional. A really great typography is meaning. So we want to use this stuff and go say something. Thank you. questions and I also could, if people are interested, give you a little quick preview of some of the things like the Firefox dev tools. I'd be happy to show those off. Yeah. Should I do that first? Um, what do you guys Yeah. Yeah. Alright, let's do that. Uh, so if you go to nightly.mozilla.org, that will take you to the page where you can get the nightly build. It's now updating. Um, and there's only one flag that you're going to have to enable in order to, to do that. So if you go to about, colon, config, and you want to start searching for devtools. Inspector, font editor, enable. That's it. So this will by default um, be set to false. All you need to do is double click that and it will set it to true. Yep. And you can then go back to Oh, that's not going. Okay. <coughs> so, because in in true developer fashion, I can't possibly make a demo without building a CMS to put it in. I've been working on this little uh, Drupal site where. I can upload the variable fonts and paste in my CSS and put all these demos in place. Uh, but the important thing is, uh, now that we've enabled that one flag, I can now select a little bit of text, go to inspect element, and by <coughs> default, your dev tools probably look kind of like this. And you'll have these different panels over here that you can look at, and that's nice, but getting a three panel look is going to be really helpful. So you click on that icon, make sure the fonts panel is selected, and I had, there we go, I had clicked on the H1. Now when I float over here, we'll see that icon. So that's only going to be there if there are variable font stuff in that CSS. And I click on it, there you go. And you have all of this accessible, excuse me, so you can just drag this stuff around and play with these different axes. And if you look carefully at the center part here, that would be bigger. You'll see while I'm doing that, it is actually updating the values in the CSS. Now, one of the things to bear in mind is I've been playing around with the STL bar here. Uh, this is a demonstration typeface. It's not really meant for production use, so it lets you do a lot of really ugly things with it. But it's a great way to experiment with all the different things you can do with a variable font. So there's a whole bunch of different sliders here, and they're trying to put some more readable names in here. Things like serif height is kind of interesting. So if you 
take a look at the differences in the shape of the serif symbol letters for things like uh, the Y transparent of the uppercase letters is going to change the height of the uppercase letters. And there's a few other things in here, but you, you, can, you can play around with this stuff and actually see it in your layout. That's the thing that will be really helpful. So a lot of these demos I was putting together with a single typeface for the whole page. But I was just playing around with things like width and weight and ascender height and descender height to just see how things might work to create a greater level of visual distinction without having to load another asset. And one of the things I played around with was this um, as a, a TTF file that you would get by just downloading from GitHub is something like 130 or 140K, which one file to get that much variation is not that bad, but I used a converter to turn it into a WAF2 file, it was 80. So 80K to get like near limitless variation is pretty awesome. I mean, you really get a lot out of that one asset that you're loading. Now, a lot of them are going to be a little bit less variable than that. You're going to see a lot of them that come out that are probably going to have just width and weight. But that alone is still going to give you a lot to play around with in terms of creating a greater level of hierarchy and, and sort of visual distinction. And the other thing that uh, I wanted to show you briefly on CodePen Um, so if you uh, take a look at the tools, um, if you just look up, uh, look me up on, on CodePen, uh, I've got a number of different examples here, but if you look under collections, I've put a lot of the variable font stuff together. And so one of the ones that's there is, um, uh, is that little Outdoor Adventures one and uh, this Moby Dick page. But um, let me show you what's going on with this one. This one is just a, a single paragraph to play around with. Uh, but there's a few controls in here so you can kind of see things scale. And if I change the view here, this up on the side. Um, so you, this just kind of, in, in place of making the screen bigger and smaller, I just put a couple classes on this so that you can see what's happening. And then you can also turn things like width scaling on and off. So you can kind of see what a difference it makes if you are scaling the text for a small screen versus not, you'll see how things reflow. But then also on the side, you can see everything that I've done with all the variables and the calculations. So have a play around with that and, and see what you think. And what I wanted to make mention of is, you know, I mentioned that if you're going to redeclare width or weight, you have to have that whole string of font variation settings. You have to redeclare all of it, unless you're using CSS variables for the value. So that's a little, a little workaround where when you are declaring these font variation settings, so if you see right here, for width, weight, optical size, and grade, and using CSS variables, all I have to do is redefine that one variable at a given breakpoint. The whole thing changes without having to rewrite the whole line. So that's a, a way for you to tie into a lot of these things. Um, the CSS variables are incredibly helpful for that. So you can do things like just change the low end of the paragraph type scaling only when it's in a sidebar. And so you can scope that in sidebar, paragraph, change the low end variable and everything else recalculates without impacting anything else in your, your system. Is it possible to set the variables based on the code width, like calculated, or do you have to use breakpoints or that sort of thing? Um, it, it's a combination. And the reason for that is CSS calculations by default will always have a unit. So in some of these things, you need to supply a unitless value. So for things like font size and line height, um, you're able to have a value with some unit attached to it and it'll work just fine, so the calculations are great. Um, for things where you're trying to tie into um, a sliding scale 
or as close to a sliding scale as you can get for like a font width value, you need a number without any value. So the only there's a couple ways you can do it. You can do it with JavaScript, or you could simply use the breakpoints just to reassign that one value. And I'd rather do it without relying on JavaScript. Uh, but that's something that CSS Working Group is considering. Uh, I, there's a, a few in line. Let me start with the back and we'll come forward. Hey, Jim, thank you. Sure. So um, I don't know if this is too much on the development side, but I'm just wondering, so on the font foundry side where they're creating these fonts, um, do they have the ability to define like custom input variables and how those impact vectors of their font? Like, like you're saying that there's an infinite number of attributes that this thing could potentially take. Obviously, every attribute has to be identified as what it's supposed to change, mm -hmm. and that is going to change from font to font in terms of what those metrics are. So, are you saying that on a font level, they can create like a class kind of of what their font has, like functions-wise? Well, what they're doing is defining in in the design space of the typeface itself. They're defining what is an axis of variation? And it's a little bit easier to understand something like width and weight. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I've, I had one demonstration that was actually time. And you actually move the slider and it draws the letters. Uh, so Underwear, the, the type company, is working on that. It's going to be pretty amazing. It's, it works incredibly well. Uh, just having an animation effect of something writing in and this like nice, it, it looks beautiful. Um, Bungie is all get out right now, but it's really cool. Um, so, in the typeface designer just determines what is the axis they want to change and what is the, the normal and what are the extremes, and, and they're assigning a numeric range to that. Whatever that is, it's totally up to them. We are suggesting to them that they should stick to ranges like one to a thousand for width or weight. Um, actually, width, people are generally gravitating to a hundred being the standard width and then a lower number and a higher number for narrower and wider. Um, that's still kind of evolving. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if that really answers your question. But that's, Yeah, definitely. It sounds like there's a lot of control in the design side for these fonts. There is a, that's the important thing that I really want to stress again is that none of this is exposed and usable unless the typeface designer expressly enables it. So anything that you have to work with is there because the type designer thinks it's an okay idea. Are you optimistic about that being extremely soon? Uh, I am. I am. And it, it's, it's taken a little bit of effort. It's part of the reason why I'm doing this talk as many times as I will be doing it this year. <laughs> Um, and I, I gave talks at like 15 events last year. Um, I want designers and developers to know about it um, because that helps create the demand for the browser vendors and the type makers. And they start to understand that we have a real use case for it on the web. Uh, it's going to bring about a lot of positive change in accessibility and design voice and performance and all kinds of things. Um, but everyone is a part of that. Uh, we have to communicate to the W3C and the browser vendors about what we want as designers and developers on the web. Um, and then the type designers need to understand that there's a market and the smart ones are moving toward it quickly. And, and they're the ones that are getting their stuff purchased now. Uh, so my question is about, um, so you have your, your magic calculation for, you know, you have your low end, your high end, and your middle. And you can change your optical size at the low, you know, at the smaller viewport width sizes to uh, make it easier for smaller, you know, smaller viewports, but also you could change optical view size, optical sizing for um, users with low vision. Have you tested this magical function um, while also like, scaling the like, like, scaling the text the browser or on your phone? I'm just so does it like resize the fonts because you scaled the fonts on your phone? Everything, you know what I mean? Well, so I, I'll I'm going to stand on my soapbox now. Yes. yes. Uh, if you are sizing everything in M's, it's always going to work. If you are screwing around with pixels again, <laughs> you're going to break things. 
And there's no good reason to be setting type of pixels exactly for that reason. So if you have everything, if your breakpoints are in M's, and if your text sizing is in M's or REMs, fine, like either one, uh, you will get the benefit if you if you change your text sizing and increase it, if you page zoom, all of those things are going to scale exactly as they're supposed to. They'll behave just like you are changing the viewport and, and working things in a normal way. So that's that's what you want to do is make sure everything's sized that way, and then it will behave predictably no matter what the users do. Curdy, how does that come into this whole Kerning is an open type feature. Now there is supposed to be kerning built into the font. Browsers are not always great at actually implementing it as well as we might like. Um, you're able to explicitly turn kerning on or off if they have enabled that as an open type feature. It is considerably more complicated in a variable font, but technically it is all handled by the format. So if it is a well-made font, it will be well kerned. I don't know if that answers your general how, question. How do, you, how do you make sure it's on or available and on? But just CSS? Yeah, it's just CSS. So uh, um, currently, no browser has font feature kerning actually implemented, but font feature settings kern one. And so if you look up the syntax for font feature settings, you'll see kerning is, is something is quote. K E R N close quote space one semicolon you're done and it's enabled. Now, generally speaking, in most typefaces, if if it is an open type enabled font, then it will have kerning enabled by default. That's how it's supposed to work. Um, but setting it explicitly is not such a bad thing. Um, this is a less of a technical one, but I'm concerned what this might do to font pricing. It's like right now, so like if you're designing a website. And in most cases, you're probably not going to want a bunch of different fonts. You might go in there and buy like a couple of weights and then the italic um, to save some money. Um, it seems like now they would, with this, they would essentially charge you for the whole thing. So you would not be able to pick and choose. So the question is, uh, in case everybody couldn't hear it, is about pricing, and and that is the sixty-four million dollar question. Thankfully, none of them actually cost sixty-four million dollars, but. Um, but that's generally what people are, are playing around with at the moment, is if you're buying full family, they'll give you the variable fund, or something like that. The services are going to get into it. They'll be offering them. They aren't yet, but I know they're trying to work it out. Um, that's probably going to be the cheapest way to experiment with it for most people, excuse me, is that once they're offering them on Google Fonts, once they're offering them on Typekit and Fonts.com, They'll work out the revenue model for the type designers. They'll figure that part out. It won't really make any difference to you as a as an end user. In buying them, if you are, if you do need to, to purchase them, there are a few different options that type designers have. And this is again where you will have much better luck working with somebody like David Jonathan Ross or CJ Dunn, individuals who are really into this format and if you just need the lighter weights, they could actually export a version of it that only goes from you know 100 to 700 instead. Uh, so like, there are possibilities in terms of what they export and sell, but it's kind of undefined at the moment. So yes, it, but everyone's going to still continue selling the individual ones too. So you'll always have that as an option. I'm kind of following on. <clears throat> What you were just saying there it, it is do any of the tools for creating variable fonts um, have any features such you could take um, several different you know fonts in the same family um, you know, like you have the normal font and heavyweight and an italic font and then composite them into a single variable font that's a bit of a holy grail kind of question at the moment uh, Monotype is working feverishly on tools to create variable fonts out of static ones. Now, that would probably be the kind of thing where you take 
you know, all 32 different weights and widths and variants and then like bring all of that in and try and interpolate it that way. Um, it's not something that would likely be available or legal for you to do as an end user uh, because your uh, fonts are software. So it, it doesn't matter if you've purchased a license to, to those three different weights and variants, it doesn't give you permission the, the, the user license wouldn't give you permission to then alter those and try and create something out of it. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but the, but the tools are being worked on to help people convert them, which will then make them more widely available, which will then shift the pricing model around. So this kind of expands on that, but um, more of a holy grail kind of question. But um, with SVGs, like being vector-based like fonts, and SVGs are just kind of a collection of functions and data, creating graphics on the screen, much like font files are. Do you think the natural evolution of this is doing away with separate font files and having like a set of proprietary configurations that font boundaries have? Well, not a lot of people know this, but iOS 1 through 3 or 4 was only SVG fonts. And, and they're... There's a whole other discussion there that I don't really know enough about in the type world, um, but there are different kinds of curve data and, and things like that that only work in, in true type versus another format, and then SVG can actually do both. And, um, there will be probably greater synthesis between these things going forward. Um, at the moment, though, SVG is not being used in a currently shipping implementations of fonts. I'm kind of losing track, so I, I'm in the back. I, I know that you had your hand up. Uh, do, you, do you have any sense? Oh, sorry. No, okay. uh, do you have any sense like what how type designers would take field of this? Well, that, that's been really interesting. And so, you know, over the course of the past year, I've spoken at very design-focused events very web development focused events and very type focused events. And what really struck me actually at TypeCon in Boston last year was how much hesitation there was on the part of type designers. And the reason for that is there have been two other attempts at some sort of variable font format in the past. They've been very hard, very costly, and failed miserably. And when I say failed miserably, it's not that technically they didn't work, it's that they didn't really catch on there wasn't really a driving force that would make people want them. We have that now, and that's the web. And, and so they're starting to get it. The more I talk about the value of it in web design to type designers, the more interested they are about it. I had a number of those type designers come up to me after the fact and, and say, like, thank you. I actually understand why I want to do this now. Um, so, so that's getting there. Um, the great thing that I'm starting to see now is that uh, Microsoft put out a page devoted to variable fonts, which in turn was kind of spurring on other companies to do the same. Type Network is working on their site. Monotype is working on something. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of spurring everybody on uh, to see what they can do with them. And, and again, it's um, there's a few people like myself that are, are just trying to continue going to events and getting people to think about them and play with them. Uh, going on podcasts, writing articles, all that sort of thing. Uh, because I think there's massive benefits for the web, but we have to keep the enthusiasm and momentum building in order to get more type designers to support more web browsers to get more people putting them into practice. So that's my truly good job. That's actually my same question. Uh, I was just curious what like, the Mac and Carters of the world thought about uh, variable fonts. Because it seems, I think, you know, if you have a lot of control as a designer, but like, I don't, I don't know if there's a like, friction from like the tradition of typesetting and, and creation. Um, it's it's definitely varying. Um, but Eric Speakerman thinks they're pretty cool. Um, so I don't know. Um, so at A Type I last year, which is one of the places where I was talking about them, uh, Matthew Carter was there, Eric Speakerman was there, a bunch of other um, those kinds of people that you, that you you're thinking of in the same breath, um, and 
I don't really have a sense of what Matthew Harvard thought of it, really, but I know a number of other people were pretty excited. Um, Luke's group with, uh, you know, is really a prolific type designer. Uh, he gave a talk in Berlin and, and brought up the fact that basically he went through his whole library and experimented with converting them all to variable fonts like the week before. So that's not done. I mean, there's a lot more work to do, but there are people who are really enthusiastic about it, and it's those type designers that are much more technically minded that are the ones that are really looking at this as a, an incredible way to unlock some efficiencies, but also some experimentation and some, some just novel ideas and thinking about how you draw letter forms. Um, so the, uh, the guys from Underwear are absolutely brilliant in the stuff that they're working on. Uh, Luke, Lucas is really pretty incredible. Um, the Peter and Eric Van Blockland are also um, really well-known type designers and teachers, and they're like building tools to actually do all this stuff. So uh, there's an incredible amount of excitement, um, and I think that it's starting to reach a tipping point in the type world, um, and it, that's in large part because all the browser vendors are showing up. The CSS working group was there in Berlin. They had a working session there. They presented to the group. Um, they're listening. They're really actively working on this stuff. So it's a very interesting time. Um, and it's still one where we have a, a we, and I say like everybody in this room has the opportunity to, to make their voice heard about how this implementation actually happens. Do you know whether any of the CSS style uh, mobile and desktop targeted frameworks are adopting this yet? That's probably a little too soon for anybody to be really experimenting with that. Um, one of the things that I would posit that with CSS grid and variable fonts, you start to decrease in the, the, use, the usefulness of some of those frameworks. But I'm sure that, uh, especially when things like Roboto and a few of these other staples are available more widely, like Source Sans, Open Sans, and stuff like that. Um, that kind of opens the door for a more broad-based utilitarian adoption of, of this stuff. Um, I know uh, I I know several type vendors are readying releases of open public free to use releases of variable fonts specifically to try and drive adoption across platforms. Any other questions? Other than that, we can go back to pizza. <laughs> this is less of a question, but more of a comment. I'm curious about your thoughts on it. Um, so they said that the first, whatever, how many million internet users we have um, in terms of the world have you know, the top 90% of the internet connection. And they're saying the next equivalent amount of people are going to have like one tenth of the internet connection um, in developing countries. And so it's kind of interesting that um, like one of the issues that I've seen a lot with Websites that are going into developing countries and making it extremely light accessible, but also like someone's coming to a computer, you want it to be taking advantage of everything you have available. So I think the interesting thing about this is it brings a level of design and uniqueness and branding to the developing world that they're probably not seeing, you know, when they're going to loading sites because they're not in fonts, they're not in images, whatever. So you, you bring up something that's really important. And, and one of the reasons why I think variable fonts are significant is because of the performance gain. But in the markets you're talking about, those are largely served by devices that use Opera Mini. Opera Mini does not support web fonts. And if you listen to the amount of badgering I've given them over the years, they're never going to. So it's quite likely that they'll never see that. They can still get good design, and if you're doing your job, then you are styling things to work well without the web fonts loading. There are lots of ways to do that. But there is an interesting twist that, that could happen. And I've been trying to kind of sow the seeds of this with a couple of the larger browser companies. If there were a variable font that shipped with all of the browsers, then that fallback could carry a lot of the same styling. So if you think if it's installed natively on the device, so there's no download, it's just the CSS, and you had that variable font that had serif or sans serif as a variation, 
as well as the width, weight, and and the uh, slant or italics, whatever it is. There's a little interest in that. I think people see what the potential is. Um, again, like this is, you know, this is the time to push for that sort of thing, um, because if there is that, you know, everybody kind of knows what Arial looks like, so you can kind of style or optimize your fallback CSS to work that way. Because those devices still run JavaScript, you can still check to see if the web font is loaded, especially if it supports the web font loading API. So you can specify font display swap, and if the web font never loads, it's always going to get that CSS. You could tailor things quite beautifully. Um, so it could be a, could be a really interesting solution. That might be a way to get Opera Mini to support it if they knew that they never had to load it. Maybe they sell font or sell the ability for font patterns. Yeah, well, I think the, the larger problem is trying to get them to stop like giving the phone away for free and only giving people access to Facebook. That's probably a, a bigger ill in the world than getting our web fonts out there, but you know, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, thank you. You've been awesome. If anybody wants to get in touch, um, I've got cards somewhere. Um, Jay Pommentel on Twitter and everywhere else. I will always ask and answer questions. Um, if you're interested in having me come and work with your team, just ask. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Jason. Um, does anybody have any um, like community announcements? They like to um, I've been asked to uh, bring this up of um, later in this, this month in May on May 19th and 20th is the annual Purple Monkey Game Jam at Cantina. It's um, two days of uh, making video games. Um, you don't have to be a coder, um, you just have to be creative. Um, there's multiple roles you can do. You can do art, you can do obviously code, there's music. Um, just, uh, just hang out because it's fun. Um, but anyway, if you're if you're into video games, if you've ever wanted to try to make a video game, if you've ever wanted to, I mean that's uh, uh, I mean that's even fun. So, nice. Anyone else? Hey guys, I uh, just wanted to quickly um, say something. So uh, we're from uh, an agency called Zavinci, uh, but we are uh, really busy with client work, and we are really looking for people who can do freelance, like front-end development work. Also, open to like back-end work, like WordPress uh, design work. So we we're really looking for, for help right now. Um, so um, if people you know are here that are interested in freelance work, please you know, please give a card to me if you're interested in potential projects. Thank you. Hey everybody, um, uh, my name is Jason, I'm from DraftKings, and we are currently looking for a junior, like, creator front end, I don't know if anybody here is interested. Uh, we're also always looking for, like, software engineers of all levels, so feel free to look at the application site, but if anyone wants to ask questions or give you a card, uh, just want to see you <laughs> Hi, I'm Melina. Uh, I'm an actor at Thoughtbot. We are hiring a um, designer. We're hiring people cool devs. Um, go to thoughtbot.com slash jobs. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thanks so much for coming again. And uh, feel free to stick around for a few minutes and um, hang out. Thanks. Thank you.